The video you're about to watch provides an overview of the evidence-based diet and lifestyle modifications that can be made to manage GERD. My name is Mitchell Zandis, and this is CNU. In their 2021 clinical guideline for the diagnosis and management of gastroesophageal reflux disease, the American College of Gastroenterology defines GERD as the condition in which the reflux of gastric contents into the esophagus results in symptoms and or complications. The two most common symptoms are heartburn, which is a burning sensation from the upper abdomen up toward the neck, and regurgitation, which is the effortless return of gastric contents up toward the mouth. However, it has also been associated with other symptoms like chest pain, hoarseness, chronic cough, and a constant need for throat clearing. Simply put, GERD occurs when there is dysfunction where the stomach and esophagus meet, and some of the contents that are supposed to proceed to the small intestine end up going the wrong way. There's no one specific cause of this dysfunction that can account for all individuals who have it. Beyond being uncomfortable and painful, GERD is problematic because consistent exposure of the esophagus to gastric acid leads to damage. This begins as esophagitis, or inflammation of the tissue, but over time it can lead to a condition called Barrett's esophagus, which is characterized by a distinct change to the cells lining it. This is concerning because Barrett's esophagus significantly increases the risk of esophageal cancer. So, the management of GERD early on is critical not only to avoid short-term consequences like discomfort, but also to minimize risk of long-term consequences that includes, but is not limited to, esophageal cancer. Management of GERD calls for a comprehensive approach that typically requires pharmacologic measures, especially the use of proton pump inhibitors, and non-pharmacologic measures, including diet modification and lifestyle modification. In severe cases, surgical intervention may be necessary. This video will focus entirely on non-pharmacologic measures, which I have broken down into five subcategories. Under diet modification, we have weight management, meal timing, and the identification of trigger foods. Under lifestyle modification, we have body posture and tobacco use and smoking. Then for each one we have a bonus that can receive at least some consideration when providing guidance to a patient. This includes meal size and the fit of clothing. Research over the past 25 years has produced converging lines of evidence that show a correlation between body mass index, symptoms of GERD, and risk of complications from GERD. A 2005 meta-analysis of eight cross-sectional studies found that individuals who were classified as overweight or obese were 1.5 times and 2 times more likely to complain of GERD symptoms respectively when compared to those classified as normal weight. The same study found a similar relationship between BMI and erosive esophagitis and BMI and esophageal cancer. This was followed by a 2006 study in the New England Journal of Medicine that looked at data from over 10,000 females in the Nurses' Health Study. It supported the idea of a dose-dependent relationship between BMI and GERD symptoms, meaning the higher the BMI, the more likely a person was to report symptoms like heartburn and regurgitation. Another compelling finding from this study was that it showed that significant weight gain led to increased reporting of GERD symptoms. Women with an increase in BMI of more than 3.5 increased their risk of having frequent symptoms of gastroesophageal reflux disease by more than a factor of 2. Conversely, weight loss led to decreased reporting of GERD symptoms. 
There was a reduction of nearly 40% in the risk of frequent symptoms among women with a decrease in BMI of more than 3.5 as compared with women without a change in BMI. The effect of weight loss on GERD symptoms has since been explored in a handful of prospective studies and have shown that weight loss can lead to improvements. This improvement may not be completely attributable to the weight loss, but it certainly appears that it plays a significant role. With these findings in mind, along with others that are beyond the scope of this video, obesity is considered a major risk factor for GERD by the American College of Gastroenterology in a 2020 review in the Journal of the American Medical Association and in a 2021 disease primer from Nature Reviews. The role of obesity in the development of GERD is complex and multifactorial, but the most obvious explanations include increased intra-abdominal pressure from excess abdominal adiposity and a higher prevalence of hiatal hernia. The esophagus and stomach are separated by the lower esophageal sphincter and the diaphragm, which work together to maintain a pressure gradient that keeps the sphincter tight and minimizes the spontaneous upward flow of gastric contents. But with increasing intra-abdominal pressure from adipose tissue, the normal pressure gradient can be compromised, resulting in relaxation of the sphincter that isn't triggered by swallowing. This same pressure from the adipose tissue can contribute to the development of a hiatal hernia, where a portion of the stomach slips above the diaphragm, leading to anatomical changes that impair the integrity of the lower esophageal sphincter. Hiatal hernias have been found to be much more common in people with obesity. This meta-analysis from 2011 found that overweight and obesity doubled the risk of having one. So what does this all mean for the nutritional management of GERD? Let's start by looking at what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that we blindly recommend weight loss based on body weight or BMI alone. It doesn't mean that our intervention needs to revolve around a number on the scale. And it doesn't mean we recommend crash diets or quick fixes with no plans set for the long term. It does mean, however, that for patients with a high amount of abdominal adiposity, we should explore their current eating pattern, activity level, and behaviors to see if practical and sustainable suggestions can be made to induce gradual weight reduction. If we approach the case only looking for trigger foods to eliminate, then we may be able to provide temporary relief, but we would likely be overlooking the root cause of the issue. At this point, if you feel you're getting value out of this, I'd appreciate if you go ahead and like the video and make sure you're subscribed to the channel. The second dietary factor we're going to look at is meal timing. Here, the current recommendation is to avoid meals within 2-3 to three hours of bedtime. Eating close to bedtime has long been associated with GERD symptoms because in theory, laying flat with food in the stomach increases the likelihood that it's regurgitated into the esophagus. But strangely enough, this hasn't been supported by a large body of evidence. When exploring this topic, I was really only able to uncover two studies that specifically addressed it. The first one asked 147 patients with GERD and 293 patients without GERD to answer the following question. Usually, how long is the interval until going to bed after finishing eating dinner? They found that a dinner to bedtime of less than 3 hours was significantly associated with GERD when compared to patients with a dinner to bedtime of 4 hours or more. The authors concluded that the present study is the first to show a significant association between GERD and shorter dinner-to-bedtime intervals. Since that study was clearly limited by study design, it was followed by a randomized, unblinded crossover trial where 30 patients with symptomatic GERD consumed a standardized meal at either 6 hours or 2 hours prior to going to bed for two consecutive nights. 
The effect of the intervention was measured by both subjective complaints from the patients and the monitoring of pH in the esophagus. Patients experienced significantly more symptomatic and asymptomatic reflux after the meal two hours before bed. This appears to be the best evidence to support the current recommendation, and even though it's minimal, it's one that seems reasonable to suggest. At the very least, focusing on small meals or snacks in the hours leading up to bedtime should be encouraged. The third and final dietary factor that we're going to look at is the identification of trigger foods. GERD symptoms have long been linked to specific food and beverage selections, but much like food timing, the evidence to support these associations is limited. Coffee, carbonated beverages, citrus fruits like oranges, grapefruit, and lemon, high fat foods, spicy foods, chocolate, peppermint, and alcohol have all been implicated in the exacerbation of GERD. This is because they're said to assault the lining of the esophagus, reduce the pressure of the lower esophageal sphincter, increase gastric acid production, and or lower the pH of the gastric contents. Although some foods have been shown to do these things in isolations in a laboratory setting, there haven't been any quality studies to show that there's a long-term benefit of avoiding them. As a clinician, it's important to be able to identify the known triggers. But rather than providing the general recommendation to eliminate all possibilities from the diet, it's more prudent to help patients identify the specific foods that trigger their symptoms. Ideally, this is accomplished through food journaling, where the patient can document what they eat and drink, and then draw a connection to how it makes them feel. It's certainly possible that they'll be able to achieve symptom relief while keeping some of their favorite items, even if they have been identified as common triggers. It's also possible that there are foods that are not common triggers that for whatever reason just don't work well for them. Always keep in mind that the more items you take away from a person at once, the less likely it is that you'll be able to identify what's problematic. And the more items you take away from a person at once, the more likely that you'll make the patient feel restricted, which is not ideal for long-term adherence to a change. In the end, identifying trigger foods is a necessary component of nutrition therapy for GERD, but it should be done alongside fostering an overall healthful eating pattern that includes foods from all food groups. Moving forward, I feel one area that could use more attention is the effect of meal size. In the literature, there's often mention of gastric distension from large meals triggering relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. However, I haven't been able to locate any trials that have explored the effect of multiple small meals versus fewer large meals per day on GERD symptoms. It also appears that a diet consisting of generous amounts of high-volume foods like fruits and vegetables may be protective against GERD, which seems to run counter to a plan for small meal size. For these reasons, it didn't make it into my top three recommendations, but I felt it was still worth mentioning. Just to recap quickly, from a nutritional perspective, management of GERD should appear as follows. 1. If a patient has obesity, especially when the fat is deposited in the abdominal region, the most effective strategy for managing symptoms appears to be weight reduction. 2. Patients should be encouraged to avoid meals within 2-3 to three hours of bedtime. And 3. Patients should participate in the identification of trigger foods, followed by an elimination of those that are found to be problematic. We may also give some consideration to suggesting smaller, more frequent meals rather than fewer, larger ones. Finally, all of this is baked into the promotion of an overall healthful eating pattern that includes foods from all of the major food groups. Now we can move on to lifestyle modification. The American College of Gastroenterology suggests elevating the head of bed for patients with nighttime GERD symptoms. 
This can be achieved by sleeping on a wedge pillow, which is an intervention that's supported by multiple studies, including several randomized controlled trials. These can be purchased on Amazon for anywhere from $35 to $150. Patients may also be asked to sleep on their left side instead of their right side, since laying on the right side appears to be a position that favors reflux. For patients with daytime symptoms, it's best practice to maintain an upright position while eating and avoid laying flat immediately after meals. The American College of Gastroenterology also suggests the avoidance of tobacco products and smoking in patients with GERD symptoms. The mechanism that seems to be responsible here is twofold. First, tobacco reduces the resting pressure of the lower esophageal sphincter. Second, it increases the time it takes to clear acid from the esophagus because of a reduced salivary secretion rate and a reduced concentration of bicarbonate in the saliva that's produced. Smoking has been shown to contribute to the development of GERD, and smoking sensation has been shown to reduce GERD symptoms, topics that are explored in detail in this review article from 2017. One additional lifestyle modification that can be recommended to patients is to avoid wearing tight-fitting clothing around mealtimes. This is because it appears to increase intra-abdominal pressure in the same way that a high amount of abdominal adiposity will. Adding in the evidence-based lifestyle modifications, we should encourage patients to keep the head of bed elevated at night using a wedge pillow and remain upright after meals during the daytime. We should also encourage tobacco and smoking cessation for those who are active users, and of course, discourage those who are not active users from starting. Last but not least, we can give some consideration to the idea that patients with GERD should avoid wearing tight-fitting clothing around mealtimes, especially if the clothing is tight around the abdomen. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel, like this video, and share your thoughts about it down in the comments section.